We see in the scriptures the Messiah will indeed be divine. So during the time of Christ, a lot of the Pharisees, they condemned him for acknowledging that he was God, for acknowledging that he was indeed the Messiah. They are forgetting that it is revealed in the prophets, especially here in Isaiah 7, 14, that the one who is to come will be God. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, sh and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So the, the one who will be born of a virgin, so how can you be born if you're not human, right, will be divine. Isaiah is foreseeing the one who is to come will be fully God and fully man. God is with us. Unto us a child is born, and his name will be called the Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Showing that the one who is to be born of the Virgin will be Mighty God, and he is everlasting like the Father. He is eternal. He has always existed. I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now I can't pronounce that word right down there, but that's uh, the uh, title in Hebrew right there. <laughs> the Lord our righteousness from Jeremiah 23 and 33. So again, two, pro two of the major prophets right there. Isaiah and Jeremiah acknowledging that the Messiah, the one who is to come, will actually be divine. He will be born of woman, so he will be fully human as well as fully God. Showing, again, the triune nature of God. And I will pour on the house of David, so the house of David, so the line of David, his descendants, even though the kingdom of Jerusalem fell in the Babylonian exile, the line of David was not snuffed out. It continued. And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, the spirit and supplication, so the spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. And who was pierced on the cross? Jesus. Jesus. So they will see the one who is pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. From the prophet Zechariah, right? So they will look upon God. It is God who will be pierced upon the cross when the Messiah comes. Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, so the Son of Man is a title given to the divine in the, in the books of the prophets. This is specifically from the book of the prophet Daniel. Yes, Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel is also called a Son of Man because, like the prophets, he is a godlike figure. He came in to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom which is one that shall not be destroyed. So all of the different languages that happened at the Tower of Babel, that got separated, that had to divide themselves because of their language barriers, will now be reunited by the coming of the Messiah, and we will all speak one language, the universal language of the truth that is our Catholic faith, because again, the word Catholic, Catholicos in Greek, means universal. So though we are different people, different nations throughout the world, we speak the same language, the same language of faith. The rite, the dogma, the theology, everything having to do with our faith is the same. Wherever you go, if you go to Africa, the Mass is celebrated the same. You go to Australia, Asia, wherever, it is celebrated exactly the same. Because the Lord has come and established the one kingdom and brings us into the universal language that is our Catholic faith. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's right in the very beginning in the story of creation. The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, 
the third divine person of the Trinity, the personification of love, is circling over the waters of creation. And why are waters acknowledged here before the rest of creation? And it's because it is a prefigurement of baptism. So it is through water that life comes into the world because it is water that is life-giving. When, when a child is conceived in the womb, it is conceived in water. When it is about to be born, water comes forth from the mother, symbolizing that new life is about to enter the world. We are immersed in water. When we are baptized and born into new life in Christ, the majority of our physical being is water. We need it to sustain our life. And so the Spirit hovering over the water shows that through, that from the Spirit, through the waters, life will come into existence. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So this is Psalm 51, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah murdered. He is praying this psalm as an expression of repentance for purity of heart, begging God to not take his presence away from him. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And this is a great, pro a great prophecy, again, from Isaiah. There's so many, so many great things in Isaiah. I would encourage you to read it if you haven't already. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Who's Jesse? Braxton? Don't know? Anybody? Nick? No. Jesse is David's father. Jesse is the father of King David. So a rod from the stem of Jesse. So from the line of Jesse, from whom David comes and from whom Jesus descends. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. That branch, of course, is Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. As the Holy Spirit is seen coming down upon Jesus at his baptism, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, right there. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, there's two gifts of counsel and might, there's two gifts of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Two more gifts of the Holy Spirit will all dwell within the person of Jesus because he is one with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is upon Isaiah because he is God's chosen prophets during that particular time. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon Isaiah, and it is the wisdom of God in the Spirit that he is speaking to the people, as all of the prophets did. In the New Testament, one Lord, there is only one Lord. The Father is Lord. I will be a father to you, says the Lord Almighty. As Paul, St. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, the Son is Lord, as Peter reminds us, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ at his return, and the Spirit of the Lord. Now the Lord is the Spirit, as St. Paul acknowledges in 2 Corinthians, because he also, though he, did not, he was not with Jesus during his earthly life, received the anointing of the Holy Spirit as an apostle. The apostle, the chosen apostle to the Gentiles. And who are the Gentiles? Not just the Greeks, they were though, the, though they were everybody who's not Jewish, everybody who is not of the covenant of Israel. So, so to the Jews today, we would be considered Gentiles to them, which is uh, no, no harm, no foul. You know, you know, you know, you know, we love them. We don't, we don't bear any grudge. So, and so the Father is God. He received from God the Father honor and glory. So who is St. Peter talking about in that? He received Jesus. He received glory and honor from God the Father because he is faithful to his Father. The Son is God. In the beginning was the Word. Again, there it is. John chapter 1, verse 1. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John is acknowledging the divinity of Christ, that Jesus has always existed with God the Father because He is also God. He has existed with the Father because He is also God. God the Son, one with the Father. And Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. So Ananias and his wife, they were hoarding some of their wealth away from the ministry of Christ, and so not putting their trust in the Holy Spirit. And so St. Peter is addressing them like this. 
Why have you allowed the enemy to fill your heart and lie to the Holy Spirit? And it was because of this, Ananias and his wife were struck down dead. So you do not lie. You do not deceive the Holy Spirit. You do not attempt to put the Holy Spirit to the test. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So this, so this is from 1 Corinthians. Who is St. Paul talking to? Who is the temple of God? You. All of us. We are the temple of God who dwells within us in the sacraments, mainly through the Holy Eucharist. So therefore, our bodies are meant to be treated as such. We are to take care of our bodies physically, spiritually, in every way. You know, we exercise. We eat well. We pray. We do everything that we need to, you know, staying away from sins of impurity in order to guard the temple of the Holy Spirit. We firmly believe and confess without reservation that there is only one true God, eternal, infinite, and unchangeable, incomprehensible, meaning not fully comprehensible, almighty and ineffable, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, <coughs> three persons indeed, but one essence, substance or nature entirely simple. So in the beginning of the Catechism. So right in the very beginning, the Catechism acknowledges that we only believe and worship one God. Though His essence is one, He is three persons. And this is the central mystery of the Christian faith. And a mystery is something that, that we can know only partly, and only because it has been revealed to us. So we can know it partly, though not fully, from the side of paradise, as I mentioned. And we can know what it is that we know be only because it has been revealed to us. So we are given again the, the final commission of our Lord before He ascends. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So right from the mouth of Jesus, He is declaring God as Trinity, which He Himself is a part of. But the Comforter, Jesus says, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will eventually come to you. And there are a diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. We talked about recently in the, in the homilies of Pentecost about how there are fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So fruits, like patience, love, gentleness, joy, gratitude, while gifts of the Spirit, like healing, prophecy, those, those speaking in tongues, those kinds of things. So, th so those are the differences. But it is from the same God who works all in all. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. See, the, I probably should have explained this earlier, but uh, just what these numbers are referring to, it's referring to the person of the Trinity. So when this particular number is revealed, it's referring to God the Father. So when Paul is saying, uh, Lord, here, he is referring to Jesus. And obviously, Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity. So that's what... Uh, those numbers mean, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that earlier. But that's so you know if you ever want to review this material. For through him, Jesus, we both have access by the one Spirit to the Father. Okay? And, there, and here it comes to the letter to the Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might through his Spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And, you, and, you, when I, and I won't read those all word for word for you, but these are from uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and from 1 Peter chapter 1. Where Jesus continues to be acknowledged by the apostles as God. And they are eyewitnesses to the ministry of Christ, so it is therefore the eyewitness testimony that we put our confidence in. Now the dogma of the Holy Trinity. Okay. Now the Trinity is one. Not three gods, but one God and three persons. The divine persons do not share the one divinity among themselves, but each of them is God whole and entire. Meaning that God is fully God. He doesn't receive anything that makes him more fully God from the Son and from the Holy Spirit. And vice versa. Jesus doesn't receive anything from the Father that makes him more God than he would if he were not in communion with God the Father. Because if he were not in communion with the Father, then there would be two gods. That is why their nature is one. They are fully God in essence, though they function as different persons. So God the Father functions as Father, God the Son functions as Son, 
and God the Holy Spirit functions as the Spirit, right? Father, Father Fred and I are both diocesan priests, but he functions as pastor, I function as parochial vicar. So the bishop is also a priest, but he functions as the bishop, the successor of the apostles here in the Diocese of Phoenix and the Holy Father's representative here. So we share the same, the same uh, uh, ranks of office, so to speak, but we the, the same uh, the same nature, but that there are different functions. So the nature of the office is the same, though there are different ranks of authority: deacon, priest, and then bishop. But there are there are different functions. So just for example, Father Fred was once the uh, vicar general for the diocese. So again, we are both diocesan priests, but he held a higher office function at the as the right hand of the bishop. Does that make sense? Okay. So the divine persons are distinct from one another, not modalities of the divine being as water, ice, and steam, which are the different, which, which are the different uh, forms that, uh, that water can take. God is one, but not solitary. Okay? So water can take on a couple of different forms. It can be frozen, it can evaporate into steam, and it can also be liquid, right? But it is still the same element, nonetheless. Now the divine persons are relative to one another. The distinction between the persons resides in their relationship between one another. So the Father is always Father to the Son, and the Son is always Son to the Father. And that love that is again reciprocated between them from all eternity is eternally personified in the Holy Spirit. This is just kind of a basic illustration, just to kind of to kind of paint a clearer picture of how we can visualize it. And speaking of illustration, it's just something a little random to point out here. I don't know if you've ever seen an image of God the Father, like in, in uh, stained glass or in some type of iconography, but you'll notice that behind him, it's not a round halo, but it's usually a triangle. And why is there a triangle around his head, uh, behind his head as... Uh, like the halo is is around behind Jesus in the iconographies that we have. It's because that the triangle identifies him as God the Father. That that's who that individual is, and he is the first person of the Trinity. So that's why he's depicted with a triangle behind his head. Typically in our iconographies, just as the halo of Jesus usually takes the form of a cross to show that this is that this is Jesus. Sometimes you'll see in iconographies Jesus as a child. He's surrounded with a halo that has a cross in it, so they'll know that this is so that we'll know this is Jesus as a child or as a boy. So God as person, he knows and he loves. Because he is infinite, his knowledge and love are also infinite. So unchanging and unbreakable. Because he is infinite, his knowledge and love are simply himself. So it wasn't self-love that God had that inspired him to bring about us into creation. It was because, because of the infinite love that is shared between Father and Son that is so infinite and so identifyingly themselves that they wanted to share that with others. And so therefore, we were created. Not because we had anything to God's greatness, because we don't, or but it is because of who he is. He is knowledge and love itself. That is his identity. He doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't have love the way we do. He is those things. That is his identity, his very nature that he shares with us. Now the second person proceeds from the first by way of knowledge. And the third person proceeds by way of love. So what does Jesus say? No one knows the Son. No one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son except the Father. So it is by way of knowledge. You see in that terminology there that they know each other, that they relate to each other, that they're one with each other. And that, it, and that is again personified in the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus God the, is God the Son and God the Word. He is the Word made flesh. As John says in chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, a son is like in nature to the father, right? I look a lot like my father because I am like in nature to him. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. You be the judge of that. 
So the Son, like the Father, is infinite, omnipotent, and eternal. He has always existed. People tend to think that Jesus didn't exist until he was born. Well, no. If that were true, then he wouldn't be God. So he was an eternal spirit in communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. Now, God's Word is pure spirit. So his Word is like a thought or an idea, right? So that's the, that's the basic metaphysical principle of all of creation. See, how can something come into existence without a thought or an idea, right? And a thought or an idea has to come from where? A creator, right? No one could have created this projector unless someone had the idea, right? No one could have made it unless the idea was shaped by the one who built it. So that's why something can't be created out of nothing without there being a form of will and intelligence behind it. So that's why we know that creation has to have a creator. Someone had to have the idea. Someone had to bring it, had to design it, and then bring it into existence. So God knows himself. When God thinks of himself, this thought must be perfect because God himself is perfect. So whatever is in the Father must be in this idea of himself, the image of the invisible God, right? So Jesus is perfection itself because he is the image of the invisible God, right? And I won't read all of that for you. <laughs> now the third person, okay. Between the two infinite persons, the Father and the Son, there is an infinite love, and I've been saying this throughout the course. Since in their mutual love they give everything they have, then the love between them is perfect. So that love produces an eternal person as well. The Holy Spirit. So there it is. See, see, I repeat those important things multiple times so that we remember. Not just because I like hearing myself talk. <laughs> now the work of the Trinity. Okay. And now we see in the existence of the cosmos, the balance, the balance, the harmony that exists is miraculous, right? For people to think that something like that happened by accident is beyond me, right? It's astronomically impossible, right? Mm -hmm. If the sun were just a fraction closer, just a decimal point closer to the earth, we would burn up. Mm -hmm. If it were a decimal point further, we would freeze to death. So something like that happening by accident, is, uh, it's, uh, that would be a miracle in itself. And so that's, not, uh, that's the, one of the miracles of atheism, I guess. But we see in the cosmos itself the intelligence, the will, and the vision of God put into practice, right? We see that even though the universe continues to expand, it continues to expand in balance and harmony. As it expands, nothing gets thrown off, right? Nothing falls out of balance. So that can only happen if it's happening by the hand of a creator. God freely wills to communicate the glory of his blessed life, such is the plan of his loving kindness. He destined us in he des, excuse me, he destines us in love to be his sons, conformed to the image of his son through the spirit of sonship. God's plan unfolds in the work of creation, the whole history of salvation after the fall in the garden of Eden. And the missions of the Son and the Spirit, which are continued in the mission of the church. So right in the very beginning, after the fall, the there was a plan put into motion that the Messiah would come. That he would bring us back to paradise and reverse what it is that had been lost by our first parents. And the whole divine economy is the common work of the three divine persons. So the divine, eco the divine economy... The divine economy, the physical world as well as the spiritual world, because there is the spiritual world of the angels, of the souls in purgatory, the souls in the kingdom of heaven, the damned in hell, that exists. There is a hierarchy. I mentioned just briefly in a homily the other day about the hierarchical structure of the of the angelic world, both the glorified angels as well as the the condemned angels. There's still a, a world of hierarchy and rules that exist that they must follow. Each person has a unique role, including the Father. The Father is creator and provider. 
The Son is Savior and Redeemer. The Spirit is Sanctifier, Guide, and Guarantor. I hope I'm saying that right. The work of the Trinity. Okay. So we've got just a few more, a few more minutes and uh, just a couple of more things to get through here, and then we can open it up to ask any, ask any questions that we have. Now, in creation, we hear, again, right from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, creation is coming into existence specifically at the will of God the Father. And the Son, all things were made through Him. So, God creates everything through the Son. Because without Him, nothing was made that was made. And then the Spirit, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the Spirit sees to it that everything that is be cre being created by God the Father through the Son is brought about. Okay. Now at Jesus' baptism, the Father speaks. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God, is God the Father is specifically identifying Jesus as His eternal, only begotten Son. Then Jesus came up immediately from the waters, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove <coughs> and lightning upon Him. So, the bapti His baptism marks the beginning of His public ministry, right? And the Spirit, who had anointed all of the prophets of old, comes to anoint Him as the ultimate prophet, in my, far more than that, obviously, to begin his ministry. And the grace of the Spirit will be with him. At the resurrection, the Father says, Jesus of Nazareth, excuse me, this is the apostles talking, Jesus of Nazareth, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. So Jesus is raised up. He lays down his life of his own accord because, as he reveals, he has the power to take it up again. And that's exactly what he does. And the Son, Jesus, says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, they thought that they were thinking about that he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem, which would have taken nearly 50 years to build. And they're saying, You're going to rebuild this in three days? Are you out of your mind? And he was not speaking about that temple. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Three days, the temple of his body will be raised up. And so what happened? Then the Spirit. But if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So we have the Spirit that has raised Jesus from the dead dwelling within us through the sacraments. Though we age in this life, our, though our mortal bodies age, the Spirit of God continues to dwell within us. And that is when, at the resurrection, the second coming of Christ, our soul will be reunited with our bodies, and we will live in a glorified state with Christ forever, God willing. We're not there yet. So, the working in the believer. So we see the presence of the Holy Trinity working within us. So don't ever be afraid to make the sign of the cross in public. I've met a lot of Catholics who these days are afraid to make the sign of the cross in public because they don't want to give away their identity of being Catholic. Well, don't be afraid of that because we need to let people know that we're here and we're not going anywhere. And neither, neither is Jesus and neither is the church because Jesus promises, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. And so we want to work as emissaries, as Metatrons, to bringing that awareness to people that yes, Jesus loves you, but you need to repent of your sins because nowhere in the gospel, nowhere in the New Testament do we see the apostles going around telling people Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. Nowhere in the New Testament are you going to find that. It's true, yes, but what are they? But what is their ministry? They go about preaching repentance. Repent of your sins, be baptized, and come and live in the way of Christ, that you may be saved. And so that's the message that needs to be proclaimed. Yes, Jesus loves you, but you need to repent of your sins, and turn away from sin, and be faithful to the gospel. Because what does the Father say? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. So, yes, God loves us, but we need to keep his word. 
For whoever denies Jesus before others, Jesus will deny before his heavenly Father. We will come to him and make our home with him. See, Jesus is saying, he's acknowledging the triune nature of God. We will make our dwelling with him, within him. Because the spirit of truth, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And we continue to, to nourish and nurture and strengthen that, that reality through the nourishment and the grace of the Eucharist. So St. Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that he would grant you to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. So if the Spirit of God is dwelling within us, we shouldn't be afraid then to make the sign of the cross in public among everything else. Because in the resurrection of the believer... For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells within you. So, we see in the very beginning, again, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So as the Catechism acknowledges, being in the image of, the God, of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person. He is capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of freely giving himself and entering into communion with other persons. Because these are all the things that happen within the community of the Holy Trinity. There is self-knowledge, self-possession, and there is a free giving of oneself to another, and thus entering into a communion of persons. And as we've hopefully learned throughout this course, is that we share in God's life, and if we share in God's life, we share in His mission. God wants to make Himself known and share His life with us. It's a beautiful thing. And He gives us the choice to either do that or to not do it. And he, honors, and he honors our free will. He always does. God created us so we may share in His truth, beauty, and goodness. When we come to a deeper understanding of that more and more, we find how the living of the faith is not something that is meant to be burdensome, but it's something that's meant to be liberating. It's something that's meant to be uplifting and powerful. So you hear, you hear a lot of people say, well, I don't want to become Catholics because there are so many rules that you've got to follow. Well, okay, well, what rules specifically are you speaking of here? The, uh, the, purity, the purity laws, uh, coming to Mass every Sunday to receive God. What rules are you talking about here? Okay, well, there are rules for everything that we're involved with, isn't there? There are rules for the games that we're playing. There are rules for being in a classroom. There are rules for the jobs that we have. So why is it so hard to... So why are you not wanting to follow God's rules? Well, I don't know. Now, the liturgy makes possible our participation in God's life because we receive Him in word as well as in sacrament. And it's the mystery of Christ's salvation that's made present to us in the liturgy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because what happens at the epiclesis when this happens? So this is a gesture. The priest is calling down the Holy Spirit upon the bread and the wine. See, that's why all of you are not meant to be doing this in the Mass. See, the, 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 I, know, I, know a lot of I know a lot of folks will say, well, Father, that's something that we've always done. And yes, I know. I know you may, you may have always done it, but that doesn't mean it's right. Because, so, that's, so, so, I'm, so, I'm, so I'm sorry to have to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, see, when the priest does this, he's calling, down upon, he's calling down the Holy Spirit upon all of you with his anointed hands. And all of your hands are not anointed, so that's why this gesture is not meant to be reciprocated to us. Thank you, but it's not meant to be reciprocated to us because the, uh, that is not a Roman gesture for, for the laity. It is a Roman gesture specifically for the priest. 
So when we say at the beginning of the preface prayer, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, we say, we're not saying lift up your hands. We're saying lift up your hearts. So lift up your hearts, not your hands. Keep your hands in prayer. See, the only time the, you should be doing any, the ladies should be doing anything with their hands in the Mass is when they're giving each other the sign of peace or when they're coming up to receive communion. That's it. See, even when the little ones at the 9 o'clock Mass are leaving, we're not meant to be doing this because, you know, I don't want to say what that, what that looks like to, <laughs> to, the, to, the average, to, the, to the average person, but just, uh, of course, that's definitely not what we're doing, but uh, the average person doesn't know that. So, uh, so but that's a... But, but the, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that a little bit more uh, later on in July. See, I'm not just... Uh, I don't want to just say, you know, don't do this. I want to say, don't do this because. And so we're going to get into that uh, explanation a little bit more in some July Sunday Masses. So, uh, with that, that is uh, the uh, fi the final slide that we have. So, we just uh, whatever, whatever time we have left, any questions you have about this material, about the Trinity, or just any questions that you have, you know, feel free to feel free to ask. Any clarifications? Any confusions? I know this is a, a very difficult topic to cover, so right back there. This might be common knowledge, so pardon my ignorance. Um, but Nick, you got to talk a little louder. I can't hear you. Uh, do we know why Jesus waited so long to get baptized? Do we know why Jesus waited so long to get baptized? It's because he um, was it was the the baptism that was going to signify the beginning of his public ministry so he uh, waited to be baptized in order to symbolize the beginning of his public ministry that as he enters into ministry that is when the anointing of the spirit is seen coming down upon him now was it essential that jesus be baptized no because he is without sin he's perfect but he uh, baptizes. He is baptized nonetheless because it's not only marking the beginning of his public ministry, but it, he is also sanctifying the waters of baptism for the rest of us. And so, it was specifically for the beginning of his public ministry that he waited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was Melchizedek Jesus? Was Melchizedek Jesus? Yes. That's a good question. Uh, no, it wasn't. Mel Melchizedek was the priest king. That was greeted, but that was greeted by Abraham after Abraham's victory over his enemies. So, Father Fred and I, we are priests of the order of Melchizedek because he is the one. He is the holy and righteous king of Salem that will later become Jerusalem. So he is an early king, an early priest figure that acknowledges the reality of the God of Abraham by offering sacrifice to the God of Abraham because Abraham had been delivered from the hands of his enemies by God. Abraham was greatly outnumbered, but yet he was victorious over his enemies nonetheless. So that's why we say that we are, descend we are descendants of the priesthood of Melchizedek. How could he have no beginning or end? Mel Melchizedek, he did. Yeah. Mel Mel Melchizedek? Yeah. Mel Mel no, I don't think it says anything about uh, Mel Melchizedek not having uh, a beginning because he definitely did, but it is uh, the uh, grace of the order or the office that he was exercising that has no beginning because it comes from because it comes from God. So because but uh, Melchizedek was a man, so he had a beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who died on the spot. Ananias? I'm sorry. Ananias? Ananias. Okay. And, um, and I learned later in life that there's two sins that are unforgivable, and one has to do with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Is that what they did then? Mm hmm. Okay. Yep, that's what they did. <laughs> and, and, and it cost them their lives. Mm -hmm. And they denied the Holy Spirit, or they. They de they denied the they denied the providence of the, they denied the providence of the Holy Spirit, which is why they hoarded some of their wealth for themselves, rather than offering it for the the ministry. Now that's not saying that uh, we need to offer all of our wealth to the the ministry of the church. That's def that's definitely not what's not what's being said. But it was something that they did in putting the Holy Spirit to the test. And you shall not uh, put the Holy Spirit to the test. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes? I know 
someone who has that icon picture of, I always thought it was the Holy Trinity, but you said it was God in the form of an angel and the two angels? Well, it is the it is the Holy Trinity, but just where the uh, the artist of that particular icon got the idea from was from that particular was from that particular encounter that Abraham had with uh, God the Father and with his two angels, and so they all appeared in an angelic form, and so this this particular artist depicted the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity as angels, so in an angelic like form. So, sorry, I didn't clarify that too well, but it, but it is the Holy Trinity. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And for, you're welcome. And can, but for I had a lot of requests. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, a lot of requests from some folks about uh, putting a reading list on our on our website, and I've done that. So, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if you go under the resources link on our website, you'll see Father Ryan's uh, recommended reading list that's there. If you want to read up on any sources where this material comes from or anything about specific topics, there's a bunch of resources there for you. But a good one about the Holy Trinity, I can't remember if we included it on the list, is this one right here. This is by uh, Father uh, Raniero Cantalamesa, uh, absolutely brilliant uh, Franciscan friar who has spoken to the Vatican and has uh, spoken on behalf of the Vatican several times. So it's a very, very uh, simplified but very powerful work that uh, he writes here sp explaining uh, the, the Holy Trinity. So this is something that I would definitely recommend. We read this in the seminary and it was very, very enlightening. So, What's the name again? Uh, the, book, the book is called Contemplating the Trinity by Fa Father Cantalamesa. He was a preacher of the papal household appointed by uh, Pope St. John Paul II, so a, a, pretty, a pretty big deal. <laughs>